Turner. And uh, we have a wonderful panel, so I think it will be worth your time. Uh, we will ask them to speak relatively short so that uh, you have a chance to engage and put your point of view, uh, ask questions, criticize, comment, uh, and debate with us. So uh, we also will have some remote uh, participation, we hope. And we have our moderator there, Sarah Chaparia. Thank you, Sarah. So my name is Guy Berger. I am the Director for Freedom of Expression and Media Development at UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO, you may know, it's part of the UN system. It's the specialized part of the UN that is dealing with issues of media, communication, culture, world heritage, etc. So, well, we hope that uh, journalism and uh, media are part of world heritage. Anyway, uh, uh, UNESCO proposes that uh, if one wants peace in the world, you need to have a free flow of expression. Uh, and this uh, position is in the UNESCO Constitution and it came about because the analysis after World War II was that the only reason why the uh, Japanese, the Germans, the Italians could uh, mobilize their populations for war was because there was no free media. So part of this is that UNESCO should promote uh, free media uh, internationally. Well, we sit in a world today very different to after the First World War, but I think the principle still holds the same. Uh, but we also sit in a world where the Internet exists and uh, cell phones exist. And I think uh, the digital world, of course, is wider than the Internet because an SMS is not part of the Internet and many digital things are not part of the Internet. But they are still digital, and digital has, is, has very big consequences. It has consequences also. What happens in the digital sphere has consequences for the off digital sphere, for the real world, so uh, journalists uh, can uh, be identified uh, as to their movements uh, based on their cell phone movements or based on what uh, is put on Facebook, perhaps by a friend, and can be attacked because of that. So what happens uh, in the digital world can have a consequence in the physical world. Well, we're also in a world where journalists today, everybody is saying, how can media people make use of data for data journalism? And that's a positive thing. At the same time, we have some bad experiences. The British uh, tabloid newspapers hacking into digital information for purposes that I think most people do not think are legitimate. However, we also have a world in which many, many people, not just journalists uh, employed by the media, can participate, of course, in, in public discourse and doing a kind of journalism that we can define as public interest news, news that is for the public and is uh, comments for the public and that is in the public interest. So that's different to personal use. Much of the use of social media is not really journalism. It still, of course, is entitled to freedom of expression. But I think that uh, as societies we are very concerned, especially with those who are contributing journalism to the public sphere, whether they are journalists or not journalists, uh, they are contributing journalism, that is what's important. And this indeed is what the UN uh, is, is arguing, that it's not so much who is a journalist, but the function that is being performed, the contribution to, to journalism and to society. So, of course, it's very important that journalists, those contributing journalism in the digital world, should feel safe. Uh, because also, the visibility of uh, journalists is that if a, if a journalist is attacked, those who are not doing journalism but want to venture an opinion will feel intimidated. So it's symbolically really important that the freedom of, uh, and safety of journalists is of, is of relevance to everybody else. And not just the journalist sources are also a big question in this day and age of um, digital communication because sources who are communicating digitally with journalists but who need to remain anonymous because they are whistleblowers about corruption or about human rights violations they too, uh, we have to look at the question of how they're protected there. Um, so uh, I, I think that there are different levels at which uh, the safety of online actors, uh, particularly those doing journalism, become relevant. The one is at the individual level themselves, and this relates to their digital literacy, how much they know that when you produce an MS Word document and you circulate it, there's metadata on that document. Uh, which is not immediately visible, but which can be used to identify where that document comes from, who produced it, what date it was produced, etc. If uh, journalists have an iPhone, they should know that uh, 
you can be tracked wherever you go because you cannot take the battery out of an iPhone. Uh, so there's an individual level there. And uh, um, th that's at one level of safety of the online actors. The other one is the institutional level. And this is where, for example, journalists who are working for media houses, to what extent do those media houses have policies to protect them? Policies for data security, policies to deal with threats, ag online threats against their journalists, policies to uh, fight against DDoS attacks and those kinds of, uh, of uh, issues. And not just media houses, also this applies to the online intermediaries, the Facebooks, the Googles. Uh, you know. Do they have a policy to protect people's speech? On online, particularly journalistic speech. And then finally, you come to the societal level. So we had the individual institutions, now the societal level. And this is what is the society's system on privacy rights, on uh, public policy about uh, dealing with crimes against freedom of expression. So these are some of the levels. Now, our speakers will address different levels of those issues. Um, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that so UNESCO's interest is in, of course, freedom of expression uh, on all media platforms. But um, one thing that we've done to try and have a holistic approach to this is to pull together as many other members of the UN as possible into what is called the United Nations Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists. And this is to find common ground with other UN agencies to say, you know, it's in your interest as a UN agency dealing with children or dealing with humanitarian issues in, in crisis situations or human rights. You could really join with us at UNESCO in promoting uh, freedom of expression and the safety of, of journalists. And uh, I'm glad to tell you that the heads of all the UN organizations agreed to this. Uh, they've all signed off, so every UN organization is committed to trying to make a contribution. And in particular, we have identified five countries to try and work in, four countries, and uh, we are also beginning work in, in other countries as well, uh, to try and bring together the UN as well as other stakeholders, because the problem of safety is, is much bigger than any individual actor can do it. So part of the UN plan, for example, in Pakistan is to bring together political parties, governments, media, freelancers, NGOs, uh, and the UN to say, let's develop a national strategy. And to give you the further example in Pakistan, an editor of Dawn magazine uh, said uh, in the past year that he receives many death threats on email and on um, cell phones. And he says, this is not coming from the Taliban in the rural, rural areas because they do not have connections there. This is coming from people in the urban areas. And he, he said, because he's getting these threats digitally, it's quite possible for the digital trail to be followed. And these people threatening him with death to be uh, 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 brought to book and account. And the biggest problem in the safety issue is that those who are committing crimes against uh, journalists online or those who contribute to journalism, they are not brought to book. So you have the situation of impunity. So in Pakistan and other countries, we've really got to get the rule of law uh, in place so that uh, people realize, those who want to suppress information, they realize that uh, there are consequences if you're going to uh, attack journalists in one way or another. So that's it by way of introduction. And uh, our first speaker follows from this, uh, this introduction because uh, it's Ms. Jennifer Hendrickson, and she's going to speak about a research project we are doing for UNESCO because it's important that we try to actually deal with the real complex situation as to who is attacking, how are they attacking, why do they attack, how many death threats are issued on email before a person actually gets killed, for example. Well, you know, these are quite complex issues to try and understand what is happening in terms of what, what can journalists do at the individual level, what can institutions do, and what can society do. So Jennifer Henriksen will tell us about the study. Uh, she's part of a, of a consortium that we contracted to do the study, uh, and uh, her own credentials and why they, they won the contract from UNESCO is that she's author of a unique book called The War on Words, Who Should Protect Journalists? She's also the founder of a working group in the protection of journalists. And uh, her, her sort of everyday job is a communications associate at Hathaway Communications, which does this kind of research, which conducts campaigns. Uh, and she's a former employee of the Open Society and the Ford Foundation. Uh, so, uh, Jennifer, please, over to you. 
Thank you. And first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to UNESCO for having me here and also having the opportunity to speak to you as well as learn from you today and in the coming days. It's really an extraordinary time to study the safety of online journalists. It seems that every day we have a new um, revelation about surveillance concerns, for example, or uh, even journalists themselves online and off are attacked for their work. I want to cover a few, just a couple things actually today because I have about five minutes um, and then open the floor to questions. First, I want to give you an overview of our project. Um, this is just beginning and so I really want to treat this session as a consultation and to get your feedback on what it is that we're looking to study. And second, I'd like to share with you um, a few best practices for the online journalists to implement perhaps immediately um, for, uh, against some of the threats that they may be facing. So Guy talked about what we mean by a journalist, so I'm not going to really go into that, but it is worth you know, noting that it's really more about the function of news gathering as opposed to a journalist being accredited with a news organization, for example, or having formal journalism education. As Guy mentioned too, I'm one of three authors commissioned on this report for UNESCO. The other two authors unfortunately cannot be here, um, but they include Dr. Joanne Lasowski um, at Pacific Lutheran University, who's a journalism professor, as well as Michelle Betts, who many of you probably know. She works a lot in the international media space and is right now senior advisor to United Press International's Media Development Division. Also on this project, we have a 12-member, six men and six women international advisory committee to guide us in our research, to give us their insight and their expertise on the issues um, in their countries, and also to connect us with journalists in their countries that, so we can then interview them for this project. And our research will include in-depth interviews with more than 40 media, online media actors um, in countries around the world, as well as a global study. Um, and we have done a focus group um, with this study, just releasing it to about 17 people um, thus far, and we're using those insights to then craft um, a global survey that we will be disseminating in the next week and a half that will be also translated into different UN languages so we can reach as many people as possible. So today I wanted to give you a sense of the type of thematic areas that we're planning to cover um, in the study and to get your feedback on it as well. So I've written them down up here <laughs> so you can see them all. Uh, but the first one is illegitimate surveillance, including geolocation tracking, and phone tapping. The second is DDoS attacks, or when a news organization or a blog site is attacked um, and causes it to go offline, for example, like the New York Times experience, the Washington Post experience um, by the Syrian Electronic Army. Other digital attacks include malware, um, when a journalist maybe clicks on a malicious link unknowingly and then has something installed on their computer to track their movements. Um, in the initial focus group that we have conducted, the number one threat that we have heard thus far is threats via email. And I'm not sure exactly why that is the case, but it, it would make sense because it's quite easy to do, um, easy to, to make sure that somebody feels intimidated immediately <laughs> just by sending the, an email threat. And then also um, I've heard back from people who have experienced digital intimidation in online forums in, uh, in response to the work that they've done. We're also going to be looking at digital disinformation, including cyber impersonation and misrepresentation. And I was just talking with somebody um, a couple days ago here um, about her experience receiving, the sort of situ receiving these sort of um, misrepresentations online through social media. And then of course the very mundane but very um, important threat of the, the theft of your laptop, for example, if your newspaper office is ransacked by somebody who wishes to censor what you're doing and steals your laptop, there are a lot of, that's a lot of valuable data that's on that. In addition, um, uh, the additional thematic areas we're going to be looking at are, is the gender perspective on safety issues. We want to know if women journalists are being targeted in a different way than male journalists, and if so, maybe what are the reasons behind that, and what does that look like? We also want to know to what extent people have digital literacy training or digital security training. Um, again, from the initial focus group that we've conducted, the majority of people haven't had any sort of formal training, and perhaps that's not surprising, but it definitely shows that there's a huge need <laughs> for this type of training. Um, we also want to look at the issue of outing of a journalist. Um, maybe they're an anonymous blogger, for example, yet their identity is revealed and therefore they're at risk, um, and that identity has been revealed through data mining uh, or digital records requisition of their work. 
We want to also bridge the space um, and go into the telecommunications restrictions and our abuse, um, such as mobile phone denial of service or using metadata to reveal sources, which has happened. Um, one case that immediately comes to mind is of uh, the AP, uh, Associated Press in the US, um, how the, met the metadata of a few reporters' um, calls was used to prosecute someone. We also want to look at digital storage security. Um, you know, are people having violations of what they're putting in the cloud, for example? What really is secure and <laughs> what really is not? What are some techniques and tactics that journalists can use in order to make sure that it is secure or more secure? Because as we know, nothing is completely secure. And then um, also the consequences of digital security ignorance. What happens, um, there was an example actually of a journalist who was reporting on Syria and unfortunately did not encrypt his hard drive, his laptop was taken and all his sources were revealed and had to flee the country. So, you know, understanding those types of situations and giving um, best practices to journalists to use in order to prevent that sort of revealment of, ha to ha of happening. So one thing uh, that I want to talk about, again, since our research is beginning, but this is, and because it's such a complex problem, right, depends on which country you're in, depends on what your function is as a journalist in that country. There are all sorts of different actors involved. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of threat modeling, because this is something that you can take away today. Um, to, and many of you may have actually already know about this, but if you don't, uh, there are four basic questions that you can ask yourself um, with a threat model. And this comes from Jonathan Strayer from Columbia Journalism School. Um, he's uh, one of the experts on this sort of issue. But you need to ask yourself, what do you want to keep private? So specify all the info that really needs to be secret in order to make sure that you're not um, vulnerable to attack, including notes, documents, files, identities of your sources, um, or even the fact that maybe somebody is working on a story. The second question that you need to ask yourself is who wants to know? I mean, not all attacks are the same, obviously. Is it a government that is looking at your sources or that you're worried about who's looking at your sources? Is it law enforcement officials, corporations, um, other non-state actors, things like that? So it may be a single person or it could be an entire organization or state or even multiple entities. So asking yourself that question and finalizing the answer would be helpful um, to yourself when you're trying to do this study. Uh, also, listing each adversary and their interests. What can they do to find out? Um, list every way that they could maybe find out this information and then uh, develop a response to it. Third question that you need to ask is, um, what is the risk? What can they do? Are you worried about them eavesdropping or serving you a subpoena, exploiting other security laps or other accidents? Um, and then finally, what happens if they succeed? Is it as limited in some ways as maybe a story is blown, or is it as serious as somebody is maybe um, you know killed as a result? So those are some four qu those are four questions that you can use um, to ask yourself. Now some just best practices, and again this is always changing <laughs> because the digital security landscape is always changing. But here are some you know just a few best practices that you can implement immediately. Obviously, you know, use strong passwords. Make sure that they're at least eight characters long. Make sure that you have um, exclamation points or other, you know, symbols in them and numbers. Use a password management system that's encrypted on your desktop or, you know, filed away somewhere else so that um, you're not just carrying around your passwords in your back pocket and you lose that list. Um, use encryption. There are so many different ways of encrypting, and I'm going to wrap up <laughs> quickly because I realize I'm going over. Um, you can use File Vault, which uh, encrypts your hard drive. That's if you have a Mac. You can use BitLocker if you have a Windows program, um, PC. Use TrueCrypt, which actually encrypts different files on your system and gives you denial, a uh, possible denial. You can also use encrypted email. Again, I'm, I'm sort of speaking to the choir because you all are involved in some sort of internet and security. Um, you know, research, but you can use PGP or GPG as well as you can encrypt things on your cloud devices such as Boxcrypt or Trezorit. Use Tor. We all know that Tor is one of the better, you know, items out there for anonymizing and encrypting your communications. Always update your software immediately um, to avoid that being exploited. Um, use antivirus software, although it's really not um, that amazing. <laughs> it will protect you a little bit, um, and, but use open source forms of software as well um, because you don't want a backdoor installed in it if you're using a commercial version. 
And um, you use something basic like two-factor authentication that you can use with your Gmail account, for example, or even Twitter. So those are just some best practices. And then I just want to talk really briefly about some additional resources. Of course, this is just a very short list. Um, but the Community to Protect Journalists based out of New York um, has a global presence, has a really good information security report on the sort of uh, these issues. The Freedom of Press Foundation has an encryption guide that just came out that's really helpful. Uh, Columbia University's Jonathan Strayer is doing a lot of work in this area. Obviously, Electronic Frontier Foundation is a very good resource. Knight Foundation is doing something really interesting. Knight Foundation is based in the U.S. Um, and it has, uh, it's developing an online course on digital security. And so I'll be referencing that in my research. And then of course, Article 19, who I think is present on the panel. And then if you want to follow me on Twitter, <laughs> I try to update as much as I can as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, if you think that uh, you have good stories that this research should take cognizance of, please uh, do to tell her, and she, um, she's here in person, you don't have to use electronic communications to reach her, and she can guarantee your anonymity if, if you wish. So this panel is also uh, presented not only by UNESCO, but by two other partner organizations. I'll introduce them as they come, and the first one is Article 19 on my right over here, uh, who are co-conveners of this panel, Laura Tresca. She's a journalist, a social scientist. Uh, she has worked as a professor in communications faculty at the University of Brasilia. Uh, she's now uh, employed, uh, employed by Article 19 since, nine, since 2010 as Freedom of Expression Officer. Wonderful job. Um, she works particularly with internet policies and protection issues, and she coordinates research, advocacy, and campaigns on these themes. Laura, thanks for Article 19 uh, being here, and we look forward to your presentation. Good morning. I greet all panelists and participants by greeting Mr. Guy Berger. Article 19 is very satisfied for taking part in this debate at IGF. Internet and protection are core and interrelated issues for us. It's important to say that Internet governance is a debate on infrastructure, content, freedom, but also a debate about people. Once people start to be threatened by ideas and opinion they express online, protection must become a theme of Internet governance. Worried about this issue, Article 19 developed a policy paper on blogger rights. You can find it outside <laughs> the room. Um, some of our key recommendations uh, in this document are Bloggers should never be required to obtain alliances to blog or be required to register with the government or other official bodies. As a general rule, bloggers should not be held liable for comments made by third parties on their blogs in circumstances where they not have intervened or modified those comments. In Brazil, we, we support a case of the blog ASLL that was lawsuit to an anonymous comment post to, to her blog. Um, and in general, uh, the term journalist must, must be considered broadly in order to include also bloggers. So uh, the main protections that apply to journalists must apply to bloggers. Such is the case of the right to protect sources, accreditation, and guarantee of safety. Uh, this last point is very important. In the online environment, freedom of expression violations can be defined out uh, of the wide range of variables which are commonly linked to the web, such as web neutrality, um, surveillance practice, restriction to file sharing, among others. Besides the specific violations, particular to online contests, serious internet-related crimes, such as homicides, attempt murders, death threats, kidnaps, and disappearance are also frequent. What has been traditionally associated to journalism is now extended to people that elected the Internet as the main tool of expression, for instance, bloggers, owners, or editors of websites and Internet users. In addition to physical violence, it's important also to mention the increasing use of lawsuits to silence bloggers, at least in our region. Many countries around the world still have legal provisions on criminal defamation and related crimes. 
are allowed for the filling of, uh, filling of lawsuits that could lead to disproportional financial compensation. The threat of use this of such legal provisions can spread fear and self-censorship um, or materialize very concrete challenges to the free flow of information. There are notable signs which indicate that those violations, both physical violence, violence and the use of lawsuits, have the potential of getting more and more intense against these communicators who are generally individuals acting independently without any support from the big companies from the communication sector. Last year, Article 19 registered uh, uh, fifth, fifth seven uh, serious freedom of expression violations in Brazil. 16 was uh, related to internet. Two bloggers and one site owner were murdered. UNESCO and UN have launched the plan to protect journalists. Article 19 welcomed this plan and it's committed to, to its proposals. Uh, some countries, including Brazil, have started to evaluate the implementation of the plan, uh, but states must take in consideration that protection measures must apply to bloggers too. Finally, uh, I would like to highlight that do the international tweets, the states must take positive measures to address any kind of attack that aims to silence people on the web, even if the violent actions are performed by non-state actors. Although it's certain that effective redress measures should be made available by the states to victims of violence, the states should focus on preventing further violations by addressing the structural causes that led to situations of risk. But bloggers' protections should be an issue of concern of all societies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. So uh, we'll keep on going through the speakers so that you have the whole picture, and then we'll really engage with you. So bear with us uh, a bit more. and. Uh, you can see, I think, how this issue um, of safety for, for online actors ranges across the individual level, the institutional level, and the societal level. So uh, I think our next speaker is Mr. Eduardo Bertoni, um, who represents an organization that is also a co-sponsor of this, this panel. It is uh, CELE, uh, Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information. Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at Palermo University uh, School of Law in Argentina. Uh, Eduardo was the previously the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression of the Inter-American Inter Commission of Human Rights at the Organization of American States. Uh, he's on the board of, uh, advisory board of many foundations. Um, he's a well-known international scholar. And I think he's going to give us something that now even broadens this issue to the global level. Thank you, Eduardo. Hello. Well, okay, good morning to everybody. Thanks to be here. We are very happy to co-host this workshop with UNESCO and Article 19. Uh, I, I would like to be very brief. Uh, mm, some of the things that I, I wanted to, 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 to say, Laura just mentioned. Um, a little bit of history. Uh, I was in also invited to UNESCO to one meeting early this, this year to speak on a panel and the title of the panel was Digital Security or something like that. Um, and I, at that time, I added another layer when we start talking about digital security for journalists, which is the layer related to 
and I would say legal security. And that means the security that a journalist or a blogger should have when he or she is writing something that he or she is not going to be sued for defamation coming from another country. Uh, maybe you can think that this is something that is not really new, and it is not really new. Uh, journalists that were, you know, working for international media in the past, international newspapers, always faced this challenge, that problem. But the difference now is the scale of the problem. When you were a journalist in the past and you were working, let's say, for the New York Times, you can anticipate when you were writing where your article is going to be read. Anticipation is important because you can decide if you are going to say something or not to say something, or if you want to run the risk in the country that you probably will be uh, sued. But today with internet, it's impossible to have that anticipation. It's impossible because as soon your piece, your blog, your anything is online, you cannot know where this is going to be read. And the problem is worse because there are not clear definitions related to the jurisdiction and the law that could apply in those cases. And I explain. Let's say that you are writing an article from Argentina mentioning some things of the president of Ecuador. And the president of Ecuador, who started recently many cases against journalists on criminal defamation, read the article when he was in a tour, official tour in Venezuela. Can he start a defamation, criminal defamation case in Venezuela? Because he said, well, my reputation was damaged when I was here. Can he start it in his own country? Can he start it in Argentina? So, I am trying to raise the point that when we are talking about safety online, of course the first things that came up to my mind, to, to our minds, that come up to our minds, is the threats that were mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And it's okay. I think that we need to touch all of those, all of those threats and, and to, to, to try to see how we are going to, to, to solve this, those kind of problems. But there is an old problem, which is defamation, that could be a very important problem in the online world, just because we cannot anticipate where the civil or criminal defamation case could be started, unless we start working to have clear rules that define jurisdiction and the choice of law in the online world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo Bertoni, and uh, I'm sure people here know, uh, and uh, I'm sure we could hear also from uh, Laura that uh, in Brazil it is a big thing of uh, journalists and bloggers being um, intimidated or pushed into self-censorship through uh, uh, defamation cases that are even national, uh, and it's a question about what are the international standards about where does a person's right to, to reputation stop and where does the freedom of expression stop and what is the proportionate uh, uh, situation so that uh, is it proportionate that uh, defamation uh, should lead to a criminal sentence after all it's an act of speech or are there other uh, measures of dealing with this and on a global scale as well as a national scale well I think these are the societal level and global level as you said uh, issues related to safety in that area so moving on our, our next uh, speaker is uh, Joanna Varun uh, Ferraz, Ferraz, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, she's a researcher and project coordinator at the Center for Technology and Society from Fundacio Getulio Vargas, Vargas in Rio de Janeiro. Um, she works uh, with public policies related to ICT. She's a lawyer. Uh, she's a musician also, I happen to know. <laughs> she didn't put that in her CV. In her CV. Um, and uh, she's been very much e evaluating the debate on internet policies and what effect they have on fundamental human rights uh, in the uh, foundation uh, that, she, that she works for. 
Uh, she's also a video activist in terms of promoting her work. So uh, if you Google her, I'm sure you'll, you'll and you Google the center, CTSFGV, you will find um, very interesting stuff they've done. The same applies uh, to Article 19 and CELE, by the way. Wonderful websites with information on these, uh, on these issues. Joanna? Thank you, Guy. Um, so I'll also uh, prepare a very quick presentation, and I'll also focus on the societal level of uh, freedom of speech, and you know what the sense, not only bloggers and journalists, but people that have been uh, very active in social media lately in Brazil regarding, uh, concerning the protests that are going on in, in the country. Um, just to mention, um, I was also a reporter of the Brazilian uh, Mapping Digital Media Report. I just got this copy, guys, the proof reading copy, and it's going to be launched soon. So many of the things that I speak here will be in this report available soon. So uh, as many of you know, Brazil is going to host this summit or non-summit meeting on on, on internet governance, and what, but what caught my attention here is that uh, in this news, uh, the photo that uh, the, the paper brought is Dilma, our president, with Jefferson Monteiro. Jefferson Monteiro is the guy who invented Dilma Bolada. Dilma Bolada is a Facebook page, and that is where now I go to to have the agenda of the president because he he he's a character uh, pretending to be Dilma and he, he uses the Facebook to to criticize uh, and to give the wider audience um, what's going on information about what's going on about the president and for instance he, he mixes uh, like interfaces from other social media so here is like Juma talking to, to Justin Timberlake and Beyonce during uh, Rio, Rock in Rio, and then the candidate from the opposition enters the room and everybody left. So he makes lots of jokes with that. And I bring this because Brazil, uh, uh, Brazilians are heavy users of social media and becoming a very important uh, user uh, producers of, of content uh, and of news and of criticisms and comments and uh, and we use uh, mostly Facebook and YouTube they are in the, as the second and fourth most accessed URL at least in September in the country and that was uh, used of course uh, for all the protests and for people to convene and to organize the protests that are going on in Brazil since uh, June. Uh, the reasons of the protests are many. If you go throughout every, uh, uh, how do you say that, the sign, there will be one different issue. But the thing is that the police uh, responded very in a violent way, so violent that Batman had, even Batman had to come to the protest to support the teachers and so on. And among those protests, uh, media, um, the monopoly of media outlets were on a, one of the biggest uh, issues. So it, uh, many people were um, um, compl uh, complaining about global and about how it covers all the issues. And what we, we could see was that uh, protesters uh, got, and, and the journalists, uh, not journalists, people that were in, in the protests started to cover everything that wasn't go being shown in the media with their mobiles and streaming it. So they, we have uh, Media Ninja initiative and, and Media Hacker initiatives. And those channels it started to be, uh, online channels, it started to be uh, more watched and became the m major source for people who want to know where the protests were going on. Well, as it all happened, of course, 
um, the government was trying to block this and then uh, we could observe very uh, weird and threatening um, initiatives to, to, to be able either to monitor what's, what was going on. So our intelligent agencies started to monitor all the social networks and even WhatsApp, which is not public. So it's uh, complicated. And then there was this act uh, from the mayor of Rio uh, saying that uh, ISPs uh, should uh, deliver the data of the users within 24 hours to a special commission that was um, is, uh, analyzing this crisis. This decree uh, changed later after a huge opposition, but uh, what brings us uh, to attention is that Brazil uh, is going to have the Olympics, the World Cup, and it's becoming um, a hot market for surveillance technologies. So this is just a start. And, and now we need, we need um, to have a proper laws, either for data protection, which we don't. We don't have our, um, our draft bill on online data protection is still being debated. And also laws to, about intermediary in, in Brazil. Um, if you go to the Google Transparency Report, Brazil is in the, uh, coming back to what Eduardo was telling us. Brazil is among the, the highest in terms of uh, highest numbers in terms of uh, content removal due to defamation, and and because of that we have some cases in which uh, in Brazil the Google local chief was almost arrested, Facebook was almost take, taken down, and. But that, that contest of international surveillance also helped us, and I'm going to wrap this, uh, just addressing this issue, on the, um, as our president was uh, focus of the surveillance, um, one very important draft bill that was in the Congress stuck, uh, got a priority. Uh, so, in order to try to deal with the surveillance, she, she demanded that Marco Civil, our civil rights framework that deals with privacy issues, that deals with uh, data protection and mostly with intermediary liability, promoting a, uh, providing a safe harbor for intermediaries, is going to be voted in an expedite manner. So, and I'll jump this, and we are still, um, yeah, one thing that we included was the nationalization of data centers in this bill that wasn't there before, and it's a bit worrying because, exactly because we don't have uh, this uh, bill on, on data protection. And I'll stop here, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Uh, also for reminding us that uh, satirists uh, uh, need to be safe on, on, uh, on, on online. And to also say Brazil, besides for the World Cup and other events, they recently hosted the World Conference on Investigative Journalism. Uh, and of course, investigative journalists are probably the most uh, endangered species because of uh, the interests that they are disturbing. And uh, I, I do think that... Um, particularly in terms of a threat analysis, the investigative journalists need to be at the foremost of doing their threat analysis, particularly when it comes to analyzing threats from the mafia. Um, anyway, uh, I also want to mention that on the tweets, the Twitter stream, uh, Jorge uh, Luis Sierra has been tweeting a lot of resource links related to this debate, so thank you for that. And if anybody else wants to be <laughs> recognized from the floor, tweet. <laughs> uh, recognized from the, from the panel. So our next uh, speaker, I'm pleased to say, is uh, uh, Mr. Budi Putra, who's uh, uh, from Indonesia. He's a technology journalist, although today he's a CEO of uh, the Jakarta Post. Uh, he's been very long a, a, a journalist covering technology issues for CNET, for Jakarta Post, uh, for Tempo. He was the editor of Tempo Interactive. 
Uh, he's written four books on technology in Indonesian. So uh, we really look forward to hear what he has to say. He runs the Jakarta-based Asia Blogging Network. So let's hear from uh, Mr. Budi Putra. Thank you. Uh, this is an honor for me to, to speak in this uh, occasion. And thanks for UNESCO for inviting me and the organization also. So no, I, I'm already uh, I'm preparing a uh, very short uh, note on in order to discuss this um, topic. So uh, I want I want to address uh, more about uh, <coughs> the right to blog because uh, besides this blog, uh, a journalist and also a blogger and now uh, running a digital business of uh, the Jakarta Post. So uh, it is inter uh, interesting that uh, why we need to protect blogger. So I, I, I learned uh, uh, some existing discussion uh, on this topic. So uh, we, can, we, we can see that uh, there are some bloggers, citizen journalists, online media, and media actor, they are already, uh, you know, being sued uh, and, and jailed for online uh, defamation. And more extremely, even some media actor and, and journalists are being killed for, for their uh, online journalism activities. Um, I think this we, we should ad, uh, we should address uh, this threat because you know. Uh, just like a uh, previous uh, speaker and panelist said that we can count uh, blogger as a journalist also. So uh, just like a U uh, UN Human Rights Committee defined that uh, uh, journalist, uh, journalism as a, as a function shared by a wide range of actors, including professional time reporters and analysts, and as well as bloggers and others who engage in form of self-public publication in print, on the internet, or elsewhere. So we should see a journalist or journalism as a, as a function, instead of just a particular profession that link to the newspaper or, or, or the press. Article 19, that already uh, shared by a uh, previous panelist, or you should a, pe a paper, I think this uh, interesting paper, that contain uh, the rights of blogger. In the sense, bloggers should be protected as, uh, as well as journalists. Uh, journalists, journalists uh, not only uh, uh, define uh, as a, as a Fun uh, profession or occupation that only related to the uh, body of training, affiliation, or uh, professional body. But there are some issues also. Since uh, we uh, count, since we consider blogger as a journalist, so there are some areas that we, that blogger uh, should, should face. For example, licensing, real name, registration, accreditation, the prote uh, protection of the sources, protection from violence, legal liability, and ethical responsibility. So once we agree that, uh, to uh, count, to consider blogger just like journalists, and there are some issues also apply to that uh, blogger. So this is very uh, in, uh, interesting uh, issue that we need to uh, discuss because um, different than blog uh, than journalists, journalists protected by their own uh, association, newspaper. If if they face some problem, so maybe the editor or chief editor will will take responsibility. But blogger is individual, and they're doing similar job just like journalists but once they, f they face problem or being sure uh, it's, 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 it's very weird because who will 
you know, uh, take responsibility, who will represent their, uh, them uh, to, to speak or to, to find lawyer, or, uh, etc. So uh, that is why we need to help bloggers uh, to address this, this issue. Do they need association? Do they need, you know, code of conduct? Do they need code of ethics or something like that? Because um, journalism, as we know, already have, you know, a variety of ethics and standards. Maybe we can adopt some standard that related to blogger so that blogger know the rights and maybe their obligation to. The outcomes, if we can, I think uh, Article 19 of this prefer a set up uh, a set of recommendations that's very useful. Once we have this outcome, it can be used as a practical guide for bloggers about the right, how, how they, uh, they can explain if they face some situation, right? So, and this outcome can be used also as a recommendation to government, to state actors, policy makers, especially uh, what they should do to protect bloggers. And uh, in, the, uh, in the bigger pictures, this should be, you know, part of for assets, too, just like uh, we see the press. So uh, that's all, and then we can continue the, the discussion later. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Budi Putra. So um, to just tell you in the tweet, somebody, Dominique, tweeted saying, journalism should no longer be considered, journalists should no longer considered, be considered special actors in the digital space. All digital actors require the same protections. That's a point of view from Dominic. So I, I thank uh, Budi Putra for uh, also raising the issue about to what extent bloggers uh, have, uh, should have codes of ethics or self-regulation. And now we come to another Indonesian speaker who will speak about self-regulation in part uh, in uh, some of his remarks because he's the deputy chair of the Indonesian Press Council. Uh, this is Mr. Bangbang Harimuti Murti, who is uh, a CEO and publisher of Tempo Weekly News Magazine and Tempo Daily. He's, uh, um, he's an internationally known journalist. Um, he's uh, a strong campaigner for press freedom in the country, and uh, he's also been a judge in the UNESCO uh, World Prize, Guillermo Cano World Prize for Freedom of Expression, uh, uh, Freedom, World Press Freedom Prize. So, uh, Bang Bang Harimuti, uh, we look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you will address this question of uh, self-regulation self as well as a, as, a, as a factor in the safety of uh, online communication. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Guy, and uh, like I said before when you were not here, you know, uh, I'm hoping that this would be a good place to promote Indonesia for next year Freedom of the Press celebration of UNESCO. Uh, <laughs> because we need this also in a... Uh, why I said it? Because we need this to protect better our blogger, our freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Uh, because I can tell you the good news. Because Indonesia has been, uh, you know, uh, elected or to host this event, suddenly I found out that the Indonesian government made an official requirement to revise our internet law. So now we can announce that the government of Indonesia has made a formal request and has been accepted by the Indonesian parliament to revise the internet law, which is the problem of our internet law. Yeah. So if you do it uh, next year, uh, Indonesian President Day, maybe even a better revision, because it's uh, supposed to be next year. And here is my problem as I'm no longer the deputy press council since last year. Uh, Nezar Patria there is now a member of the press council. He's a, he's a good guy, a brave guy that 15 years ago the Indonesian Special Forces think he should be kidnapped. So he was kidnapped in an undercover situation, but fortunately we had changed government, so we can release him, you know, alive. <laughs> uh, 
so this is the Indonesia Price Freedom Index according uh, Freedom of House. As you say, we are, although we already on the road to democracy since 15 years ago, our press freedom is still not free according to the Freedom House. It's still partly free. Although politically, as a country, in this region, Indonesia is the only free country because of the political situation. But press freedom is not yet free because we still have criminal defamation mainly. And uh, I want to tell you a story because I'm a journalist, I'm a storyteller basically. That uh, the, the Indonesian internet law started something very innocent. In fact, it was with all the good intention. And as people say, road to hell is littered with good intentions. Right? And uh, in two, since 2003, two ministries in Indonesia, which is Ministry of tel uh, Telecommunication, Post and Telecommunication and Transportation, and the other one is a Ministry of Trade and Industry, nothing to do with freedom of the press. Third, with the, with the IT, we need a law to protect the business transaction using IT. So they created two drafts from each ministry using our uh, university academic. And uh, then the, those two, you know, it takes a long time to draft law in Indonesia. Five years later, it's those two became one uh, draft and it was under the Ministry of Information and Telecommunication. And it was all purely about business uh, transactions. And at that time, the minister was a good friend of mine when we were studying in Boston. He had this attitude that uh, anything about freedom of the press, I would leave it to the uh, press council so I can concentrate on the telecom side. Uh, so he sent me the draft of this law. He actually sent it to the press council for a comment. So the chair of the press council asked me to read it through. It's about 50-something uh, articles and uh, give her recommendations about uh, or any advice on it. I look at the draft and it's all purely about business transaction. So I recommend a note and accept it and send to the ministry back that since there is nothing uh, in it again press freedom, we have no objection and no opinion. So please proceed. Uh, you know. So we thought it's a safe law, a safe draft. So it went back to the small committee in the parliament. What we didn't realize at that time was that suddenly there was this case. Uh, somebody create a website using our president name and it's a pornographic site so there's a complaint a complaint but the chief police says we cannot do anything about it because we don't have law to 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 to, to do it so obviously there was then uh, somebody in the small committee decided to put three articles which become a nightmare for all of us without really knowing it we saw a good intention is just to protect the president against uh, somebody using his name for pho pornographic sites. But what happened was then it put a lot of people in jail. So this is uh, the law. If you want, you can download it la later maybe. And here is the, the bad article is 27 20, and 28 and 45, which is basically says if you use internet to defame someone or to uh, put pornographic things or to gamble, then you are liable for up to six year uh, jail term and between 100,000 to 100, to 200,000 maximum uh, fine. And here is a problem of, of maximum six years. Of course, it's a long time to be in jail, but not only that, even if you are innocent, proven in the court, if, if the sentence is more than five years in Indonesia, the police can detain you, and the prosecutor can detain you, and the court can detain you for up to, uh, I think, about four months. 
So even if you are found in the end you are innocent, you still can be jailed for four months. You know. And uh, and it's been uh, this this thing has been greatly misused in our experience by people in power, not necessarily from the state. Here is a, a case of the victims. There are journalists. He's, I think he is still in detainment right now. I think my friend Nezar Patra is trying to release him now. And this is just to show you why this is uh, really been misused. This journalist was writing about a, alleged mass corruption involving almost everybody in the local government. And this is usually happening in local government that has rich uh, resources, you know, like oil, gas, or coal, and so on. So that the corrupt uh, region usually can bribe everybody, including the mainstream media. So in that case, usually only s uh, very small media, which for some reason, uh, you know, either they were too small to be bribed or... Uh, either it's owned by somebody who's probably a business uh, competition or thing, then they put this story. And, and he was he's detained despite the fact that in Indonesia the press council has an agreement with the chief of police that anything uh, that related to media, the police ordered by the chief police to ask expertise from the press council, you know, to think whether this case is valid or not. And we are also, and the press council also has an agreement with the chief prosecutors. The same thing. And even we could not have an, the press council could not have an agreement with the Supreme Court. But after talking with the Supreme Court, Supreme Court actually released an order ordering all judges, if they have problem with the media, then they should ask the press council expert to give a test, uh, to testify before you proceed with the court. So in this case, they, didn't, they thought they don't have to obey all these things because everybody's there. They, they just say this is no media matter. They just decided the police, the prosecutor, and the judge there. You know, this is uh, not a, a, a media thing because this is a very rich local government. And in Indonesia, you might know we have a mass problem of local government corruption, especially in uh, rich areas because it takes a lot of money to be elected directly and of course then you have to get your money back when you are in power and of course the easiest is to corrupt the money so we have more than 200 former or still active local government in jails and more than a thousand of uh, local parliament members also in jail for corruption and the reason is because we have a good uh, independent anti-corruption agencies, but they are based in Jakarta. And Indonesia is so big that if we put it in Europe, it's like 25 European countries, or, you know, or between. If we put the West in London, and then the East would be in Moscow or the other way around. So it's a very large country. Logistically, it's difficult to supervise this. And we have only 50 investigators in the anti-corruption agency where we have like almost 50 provinces and about 400 something uh, districts. So here is why I'm at a campaigning for my good friend to have the, <laughs> the uh, press freedom uh, day next year in Indonesia because for all of us it's better that this three article is now in the revised uh, law because, you know, anyway, all this supposed to be problem, they already taken care in other laws. So even if you take away this, the defamation will, uh, you can use other law, the gambling and everything. But so far, the plan right now is still only one to, to uh, decrease the sentence into less than one year in prison. So. We are still talking about it. In fact, I'm going to have lunch today with uh, some government official to, to push for this. And I think we just have to do it. And I want to end with this 
Last night we have this blogger. His name is uh, Ben Han, uh, Ben uh, at Ben Han or Benny Handoko, I think. Yeah. Uh, last night he talked because he was detained for a day at least before the bloggers all create a trending topic in tweets because he had a fight with a flaming fight with a, a guy who was already sentenced for corruption but then somehow he managed to get himself acquitted but not long after he got acquitted the anti-corruption agency found out that the judge who acquitted him actually received bribes. So uh, all the cases here, I can tell you, only the bad, bad guys use this law. You know, it's just like it's just like the vampire; they need darkness. They cannot have openness. So that's why let's keep Indonesia open, have the sunshine, so we can get rid of all these uh, vampires everywhere. Thank you. So our other speaker, Mr. Ender Natsushin, is he, is he, has he managed to arrive here? No. Okay, if he comes, we can include him. But uh, he was, uh, he's, he's an Indonesian. He's the man you said was, was kidnapped here under the old regime. So he's uh, called the father of Indonesian bloggers, so uh, we hope he, he will come. I should say that uh, as Sia tweeted when uh, Bang Bang uh, came to speak, uh, he got on the platform, Sia tweeted that the Indonesians are bringing out their big guns. So we have one big gun, another big gun, and we're going to have the third big gun. <laughs> but uh, we hope that uh, Mr. Ender Nasushin will still uh, join us. So it's uh, now, uh, as they say in Paris, c'est à vous. It's uh, for your comments and your questions and your critiques. And uh, perhaps you could also, uh, seeing we don't have Mr. Ender Nasushin here at the moment, um, who's also in the press council, uh, maybe you also want to ask uh, Bang Bang a bit about the role of the press council in uh, dealing with self-regulatory issues. So uh, maybe we'll take a couple of questions and or comments and then we'll ask the panel to respond. Uh, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Sridhi Prahimaji. I'm a, a blogger and an activist from Nepal. I'm also related with the ISOC chapter. I'm a treasurer. Uh, I'm a founding member as well as a treasurer. Uh, uh, I have a uh, a few things to say. Uh, I was going through all the information, and I think it's it's quite the scenario is quite broad about uh, the whole uh, theme. I, I believe, I sincerely believe uh, that journalism, journalists, and bloggers and activists, you know, these are different parts because journalist it may be right uh, from your perspective where there is standardization in policy as well as all the char uh, charters and rights you know like rules and regulations are being adopted in developed countries but if you look at the developing countries the scenario is completely different uh, when i say this i i mean in terms of action uh, journalists uh, they are protected by rights you know like they have organizations um, to deal with, they have a federation to deal with, but when you talk about bloggers and acti activists, they have nobody. Uh, in regards to this, I would like to put my scenario in, uh, because I've worked as a mainstream journalism, uh, I have had the experience of working in Nepal journalism for more than 13 years, and uh, you know, um, and I've been through uh, the phase of being an active journalist to uh, blogger and now okay, I'm like a journalist then I became a blogger and now I'm an activist the thing that happened was recently uh, uh, um, uh, CIMA uh, Center of Me uh, International Media Assistant had published a report about me uh, being one of the bloggers in the South Asia and uh, the thing that happened was as soon as it published the World Bank had uh, picked up the report and published it so what I did was I updated my uh, LinkedIn profile with that uh, with a link and uh, for my surprise I was called by my um, you know office I w work in a different office as an operation manager I was called and I was like uh, given a uh, you know a informal notice uh, saying you know we can have a we cannot have a blogger though it's a content related office still so the situation is that that worse I came uh, I came here to IGF leaving my job behind I, uh, you know, they, are, they gave me an option saying, you want to go to ITF and be a blogger or uh, you want to do your job. And I said, I want to I have my freedom. I don't want to 
shove my ass there and work myself out there with no reason. So I'm here. And apart from that, you know, uh, when it comes to comes down to reality and developing world, uh, the thing that happened me, happened to me was uh, I've been very actively involved with citizen journalism. Uh, a, a year passed in 2011, November 16, I was attacked because one of my reports was published in CNNI report. So it was vetted, right? Uh, it was about uh, the um, closure, political closure that uh, that was going on in Nepal. Uh, I had to confront a lot of situation at that time because, um, you know, uh, there, there, there were organizations which ca came up front, but, uh, but since I was not, uh, um, I was not part of the journalist federation formally, so, you know, they just issued a press release. So that was about it, right? Because I was not their member. But though they tried to help, kind of like, you know, they, they issued a press release. So the situation is, reality is that, right? Reality doesn't look like, it's not all these standard norms and values. It's like reality is there's no one to help you when at, at times of need. Bloggers are alone. Right now it's coming up, evolving, but I think we need strong actions, strong mechanism, strong uh, rules and regulation to help them around the world. And I think IGF is the only forum that talks about how to help and how to evolve freedom of expression. Because ultimately if you come down to uh, developing world scenario, journalism uh, and journalism organizations are more commercialized. They are more commercialized. Most of the journalists, they, they, they write about things with, with options, right? In regards to what they are doing and like in regards to the business option. And they, 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 opt the, uh, they opt the situation of being a blogger, anonymous blogger. But for a real blogger who has his name, uh, who, who has been putting, uh, who, who are putting their voice in, they face the real situation. Citizen journalism, activism, and all these rules, you know, when it comes down to that attack, it's like nobody is there with you. You're the only one single hand person standing there and facing the situation. And all these rules and regulations, it doesn't bound because the country has signed some charter and they don't follow. Right? I received email threats like uh, before I was attacked. I, 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 I think we definitely get your point. Okay. So, okay. At the back there. My name is uh, Abu Bakr Karsan. I am the executive director of the Union of Tanzania Press Clubs. Um, I'm coming from a country whereby a journalist was killed last year. I think you all know he was killed uh, when he was covering uh, a political rally. Now, um, I have two to three issues here. Number one, uh, and this is very important, do we migrate now from journalism to activism? Uh, do we define journalists also as activists? Uh, the point of departure here is uh, journalists have their code of conduct, code of ethics, which is really uh, measuring whether they are performing uh, properly or not properly. And that is, their, that is the law uh, when they are going to be uh, put to uh, test. Uh, let us all try to discuss here citizen journalism vis-a-vis uh, -vis traditional journalism, whereby one journalist is sending the information to many, that is one to many journalism, or rather now we are in a situation which is chaotic situation whereby everybody is a journalist. Now journalism is many to many. And uh, that situation which will be the law to govern such a situation. And do we have any research which is uh, showing the world that to how far the journalists themselves contribute to being attacked by their misdemeanor or the way they violate media ethics, the way they play into the hands of uh, tycoons or political power people, 
So sometimes it's ourselves to blame, the way we violate media ethics and then we are being attacked only to come into big forums like here, complaining, complaining, complaining. So let us also discuss the way we contribute ourselves to being attacked. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gayatri from the Southeast Asian Press Alliance. I have two questions. One is taking on from Eduardo. You talked about the, I guess it's the issue of jurisdiction. It was also raised yesterday in the discussions about cloud. So do you have any thoughts about where people should start looking at uh, resolving that? Because I think even Pak Bambang himself was a victim of uh, cross-jurisdiction uh, defamation threats. Um, the second one is when we talk about impunity, for Southeast Asia we documented about 100 cases uh, of impunity in which some of them were attacks against journalists where it was done with impunity, so no investigation, no prosecution. But on the other hand, we also see the use of, the extensive use of law, uh, specifically under penal codes or, or national security to detain, harass, intimidate, uh, particularly bloggers. Um, and then there's very little recourse and there's very little accountability on the part of the government. So we have started to, 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 to say that the, the abuse of the laws and going unchecked is also a level of impunity. Um, I wonder if any of the panel members would like to comment on that uh, because it's something that we also want to uh, mainstream the discussions that impunity is not necessarily the absence of the prosecution but the abuse of the law and then not being held accountable is also a form of uh, impunity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? One, two, and then I think we'll, three. Uh, please be short and then we'll ask the panel to respond and then we have to wrap up. Good morning. Um, my name is Octavia. I work for IREX. I run a journalist security program there called SAFE. We integrate trainings in digital and physical security with psychosocial care. I have a couple of comments um, and I also have some, uh, some questions. Um, I think the first one goes to Jennifer. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the structure and the methodology of the study and why you structured it in the way that you have. Um, I have a comment about the um, the tools that you mentioned. If you could elaborate a little bit more about um, your comment on that um, these tools always change mm. um, and what you mean with that because, um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. And then I wanted, um, wanted to thank the gentleman from Argentina. Sorry, I forgot your name. Um, the complexities of the legal frameworks, I think that's very important. And I don't think that it necessarily has anything. I'm one of those people that doesn't necessarily think that the physical and the digital worlds are miles apart. I think it's pretty much the same. Digital tracking leads to physical attacks, which leads to psychosocial and psychological um, impact, which again leads to, to this, this spiral. Um, so I just wanted to thank you um, for, for pointing out the legal frameworks are an issue and how we tackle that, I think. As, as a global society um, is going to be a very interesting process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mariana Tiberis. I'm with IFEX. It's a global network of free expression. Just to follow up on what Guy was saying about impunity, I was in a panel the other day and a gentleman from Morocco mentioned that even though bloggers there are not persecuted under press freedom laws, what the state will do is use the excuse of when they're participating in some other kind of action, like say a protest, and then they're, they might be detained or harassed under um, an excuse of public order disturbance, which I thought was an interesting complication and looking at this kind of legal implications not maybe on paper it looks like the there's no one being harassed under defamation laws or that type of legislation but there's a kind of side door a back door so I just wanted to add that complexity are people t starting to look at that is there a way we could possibly address those kind of harassments thank you Good morning, my name is Ayi Makaraig. I'm a journalist from the Philippines and in our country, impunity is really a big problem. I just wanted to ask, um, what trends you've observed about attacks offline getting translated or evolving to the online or digital space? Because for example, in our country, 
Um, we have a lot of violence against journalists offline, but our inter internet penetration rate is not yet that high, so we haven't observed a lot of cases of attacks or serious attacks online on journalists and bloggers and media actors doing journalism. So I wanted to ask, in developing countries, what have your observations been? What are the usual cases for countries who are starting to develop their internet infrastructure and also the attacks possibly getting translated or even becoming sophisticated online? Okay, thank you. Well, I, I, I hope we can respond to most of those points, if not all of them. So let's go right to left, I think. Okay, thank you for, for, for the questions. Um, I, I would like to start saying that I elaborated mo more the idea of solution or, pro or some ideas related to defamation and jurisdiction uh, in, in an article that was published in a book uh, published by our organization, CELE. The book is Towards Internet Without Censorship. It's available in our website. In Sp the book was uh, originally published in Spanish, but all the articles are in, uh, translated into English, and the jurisdiction and defamation article is in English. The website is www.palermo.edu slash cele, C-E-L-E. So you can find under publications the book, and particularly the article on defamation and jurisdiction. But to give you a snapshot of what I'm thinking, uh, we need to clarify what we are talking about. If we are talking about criminal defamation or civil defamation, I think that international standards for some kind, some specific kind of expressions uh, don't allow criminal defamation. So the first solution of the jurisdictional problem is to go through an harmonization process where the countries start repealing criminal defamation laws. This sounds not very realistic, but this could be uh, one, one solution. Uh, another solution is that countries adopt some sort of bilateral or multilateral treaties saying that they are not going to, to, to comply with orders coming from abroad when cases regarding defamation are not respecting international standards. This also is a little bit complicated because what are the international standards? In the article that I published, I focus on the international standards coming from the Inter-American system of human rights regarding freedom of expression and defamation. In some way, this solution is similar of the solution that the US jurisdictions found when they passed a law that don't allow the compliance of decisions coming particularly from UK when they are not in concordance with First Amendment standards. But we don't have a universal First Amendment. We have international standards. That's why I'm trying to use this model to an international level. So those are you know, paths to start you know, thinking on, on solutions. I agree that Maybe it's not realistic right now, but it's something that we need to, to work more. Um, that's it. I think that I answered the, the question. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, so just before we move on, uh, anything from the remote uh, participants? If not, okay. So, hello? So just a uh, uh, quick observation. Um, a colleague from Philippines was asking about uh, how, how to avoid attacks and um, in, Bra in Brazil in this context of protests and so on we, we did a workshop on technical tools for alternative communications and it wasn't even uh, focused on journalists but all the subscribers for the workshops uh, were journalists so for, for me it was a a surprise, and I think it's something that we have to think about and f and, and foster. And I just want to highlight that we are going through the process of the WIS Plus 10 review, in which uh, UNESCO is part of it as well. 
So maybe it's an opportunity to take all those issues that came out in the session uh, in the action lines and, and have it more explicitly throughout the discussions. So that's mm -hmm. uh, I will comment to the, the case, the first case. I agree uh, that there are notable signs uh, that those violations, both physical and uh, use of lawsuits, have the potential of getting more and more intense against bloggers uh, who are generally individuals acting independently without any support from the big companies from communication sector. Uh, but uh, we should focus on uh, protection of the speech, uh, not a, a specific profession or activity. Uh, because uh, uh, speed, uh, the freedom of expression is a human, a human right, not uh, as, uh, exactly uh, a specific profession or activity. Uh, and uh, I just disagree that uh, I, I think we, we need to come up with principles and uh, standards to start to address uh, this, this problem because it's also a, structure, a structural problem. Okay, I, I want uh, to comment about um, issues raised by our friend from Nepal. So I think uh, yeah, you are right that uh, in every case, blogger always alone, right? So since uh, they don't belong to any association or press or, or newspaper, so at least we can see that a blogger can be one of the stakeholders for a press council, local press council, for example. So if uh, one case happened, at least a uh, press council, uh, council can uh, take over the case and try to me mediate, uh, to talk with uh, a potential uh, uh, case that uh, so we can anticipate. Because uh, this is very, it is not easy, it is, it is very co complex that we can uh, see blogger as journalist. It, it is it's just beginning, right? But uh, at least we can try to find uh, solution in, in, in local, in, in local level. Maybe uh, in Nepal, in Indonesia. In Indonesia, we have a press council uh, here, and and uh, to some extent, maybe uh, blogger can can approach uh, or talk with press council so that uh, we can find a way to respond if something happened uh, regarding the bloggers. Thank you. Um, to respond to Octavia from IREX, uh, you asked about what I meant when I said tools always change. And basically what I mean by that is a little tongue-in-cheek, I suppose, but I'm talking about the technological solutions that we try to use in order to protect ourselves online. So I was thinking about, in particular, the belief that Skype has been you know, impenetrable for a long period of time, and so people have been able to, uh, or people have used it to communicate with each other. But then recent revelations suggest that actually, no, it's not. Um, it's not a method of communication that is impenetrable. So what I mean by that is, it's not only the technological solutions that we need to use in order to protect ourselves. Um, it's it's many more than that. But at the same time, we need to understand that technological solutions are changing depending on the revelations that come to light. <laughs> so that's what I was trying to um, get across with that. And then um, um, I think you had another question. But I can discuss it with you after. Oh, methodology, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the survey will be um, in several different languages, English, Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, and French. And it will be disseminated via individual or individual networks, as well as through listservs of you know press associations around the world, um, international organizations that focus on these issues. So it's an online survey, um, and I think that makes a lot of sense considering we're looking at online journalists. Um, but that's sort of, in a nutshell, what we're looking the methodology for the survey. Um, and then to respond to the, uh, there was a question. She's now over there. Um, you were asking about whether or not physical threats lead to digital threats, I believe, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, that would be very interesting to study, um, but I don't have any response at this point. Thanks. 
Uh, thank you for my friend from Nepal, I think, and also Mr. Abu Bakar from Tanzania. I think bloggers, in, at least in Indonesia, alone by choice. If you don't want to be alone, you have also your choice. Because the Indonesian uh, press law, we define journalists as anyone who do journalism works, one, and second, regularly, and second, that he or she abide by the ethical code of journalists. So you, you don't have to have a media. Anyone who claims that is a journalist. And because of that, the press council is, by law, have to defend you, e even if you don't ask. So, but if you decide to say that I don't want to abide by the journalism code, you know, uh, and you know, so that's your choice. Uh, so, and uh, but and, and in this case, I think in Indonesia, most of the bloggers is defended by if they are in trouble, is defended, including the atheist guy in Facebook who uh, was sent to jail. So. Uh, about the other things about harassment from Morocco and Mary Africa. I think everywhere I'm asked to give advice for any countries who want to create a press law or a media law, I, I said that I think there is one thing we got it right here in Indonesia. It's an article that's, that's saying anyone who is found guilty of infringement of press freedom can be sent to jail for up to two years. And this is, I have, uh, in my experience, six years in the press council, this has been very effective. I remember one day, the Minister of uh, uh, Communication and Information, who hosted these things, was planning to make a minister regulations on Internet. And I, I know the minister uh, for some time, so you know, personally, so I told him, look, it's not because I'm your enemy or, you know, I'm not your friend. But if you sign this regulation, the day you sign this regulation, I will go to the police to send you to jail for two years. Because clearly this regulation, in our belief, and we can prove it, will infringe the freedom of the press. And I said, yeah, really? Yes. So you are cr a criminal if you, d you sign this. So he didn't sign it. And in and, uh, and, and many cases, this, so you turn the table back. I, so, I don't know. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to convince my Myanmar government friends <laughs> to put this in the law, and also the Egyptian and Tunisian. But I'm hoping if one day you have a chance to, to create a press law, please put this threat. Anyone found guilty of infringement of press freedom can be sent to jail. I can assure you, they don't like to be put in jail. Yeah, all this is good. And... Uh, and I want also to just to tell you again that I'm, I clearly believe that we have to fight any law that cri uh, de criminal defamation because this is really always been used by the corrupt person, by the mafia, by crooks. And uh, can you imagine this lady, Irasi Matupam, a medical doctor, she was just complaining by email to her friend that her superior is sexual harasser. And then she, because the superior owned the hospital, powerful hospital, and the problem in country like Indonesia, when you are a rich person, usually you have a good connection with uh, bad police or a bad uh, prosecutor because you bribe them. So they use their this law to jail whoever they don't like. It's not the state, it's the owner. And also, this Alexander Ahn, he's just a guy he, in Facebook, he claimed himself an atheist, and now he's in jail. So, what's, this is uh, unbelievable. So I, I hope you will support us in, if you meet Indonesian government people here, please tell them you have to get rid of this bad article in our internet law. Otherwise, you put a lot of good people in jail because somebody, very bad people, is don't like them. Thank you.
Okay, I think that ends everything, and I don't think I need to add a single thing to this excellent uh, group of people who've made such uh, informative comments. This is an issue that will not go away, and uh, unfortunately, uh, so I hope at the next IGF we can uh, continue to take it forward and, uh, and maybe report on some progress and maybe Bung Bung's uh, challenge uh, to other countries to uh, introduce penalties for those who threaten uh, freedom of expression. Maybe some people can report on success. Thank you.